So from now on, you don't have to look at it, you can look at the screen. Hmm. This is the history of redemption. In the beginning, there was God who created the whole universe and even time. And on this earth, God created Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden where they could dwell with God. And when God saw His creation, especially mankind, He said, it is very good. However, man disobeyed the word of God and fell, meaning sin entered into mankind. And therefore, separation between God and mankind. And as a result, death came into mankind. And the tree of life that God created in the Garden of Eden to give them eternal life was banned. People were banned from that tree of life. People were banned from that life. And so there begins his history, his story of love. And that, that history in which God returns and saves his people so that they can have life again is the history of redemption. And in this history of redemption, God promised the Redeemer, the seed. And so Genesis genealogies is about how that seed, the promise of the seed uh, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, uh, Jesus, uh, God, God promises that there will be a son given to the woman, seed of the woman that will come. That's the first messianic promise. And how that is fulfilled begins with the generations after Adam. Where is the seed? And where? How does that seed come? And what's the name of the seed who comes? What's the name of the son who comes to this earth to give us life again? His name is Jesus, right? And so, uh, history of redemption is a history in which, a uh, history that teaches us and shows us how Jesus came to give us life. Okay? And so, in this second book, called The Covenant of the Torch. Today, uh, I will share about the Covenant of the Torch, Introduction to the Covenant of the Torch. And in the second hour, the missionary will share about the fourth generation. You might be wondering, what's the fourth generation? Uh, let's read the main passage for this Covenant of the Torch first. It's in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 16. Genesis 15, 13 through 16. God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet. Now, what have, we, have I just read? This is one of the seven covenants that God made with Abraham, the father of faith. And Abraham is the one that we studied last time. The one that God found and chose to become the father of Israel, father of faith. Not only is he important for the Israelites in the Old Testament, according to Apostle Paul in Galatians and Romans, Galatians chapter 3, 17 and the following, Romans chapter 4. Through the faith in Jesus Christ, when those who believe in Jesus Christ will become sons of Abraham and will receive the blessings that Abraham received. And so something about Abraham, because God chose him to be the father of the nation, the chosen nation that will be saved. And 
This is one of the main covenants that God made with Abraham. And this content is very important for us. Why? Because this content is basically about uh, the exodus in the wilderness journey that will take place in the future. Does anybody know when the exodus was? Does anybody know when Abraham lived? What year? You will find out in the next hour. But Exodus was during the time of Moses, right? So this, this is way after Abraham's time. But Abraham, uh, God made a promise or prophecy about uh, to Abraham about how they will come out of Egypt. Egypt and how they will go to the land of Canaan over here. Why is this so important to us? In the Bible, I will talk about this a little bit later, Egypt represents the world where we used to be in sin. Canaan represents the promised land, the, the land of blessing that God promised that we, He would allow us to go in and dwell with Him. So the process coming out of Egypt and making our way to Canaan is a foreshadowing of our life of faith coming out of the world, coming out of sin, into the promised land, which is the kingdom of heaven for us. So that means this portion, this is the wilderness, this portion is our life of faith, our life in which we are living right now. And so this map is not just a map of Egypt and Palestine. This is a map of your life and my life. This is a map about which, how Jesus will come. For the Israelites, especially during that time and today, uh, the Orthodox religious Jews believe when you ask a Jewish person, Orthodox person, where is the story of salvation in the Bible? To, to Christians, we ask the same question, they will say the cross of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion. For the Jews, they will say the story of salvation is here and in Exodus. Story of salvation is about how God saves Yahweh, Jehovah, saves the Israelites out of Egypt and puts them in the in the uh, the promised land, so the land of Canaan. So let us get into what this book is about and what this portion of the Bible teaches us. Okay. First, it is about the restoration of the fall through the meeting with God. What happened as a result? We saw a little uh, introduction about the history of redemption. What happened as a result of sin and disobeying the word of God? Separation. Separation between God and mankind. And as a result, mankind is not able to meet with God anymore. So God says in, uh, in that map, God says, we, this is a map that shows us, shows you where you can be with me. And so restoration of the fall through the meeting with God. And so God here in this passage that we read, and to Abraham, God promises two things. God promises the sea and the land. Let me explain to you. It's the same. <laughs> Garden of Eden. And then. Okay. In the Garden of Eden, God created, God 
is there. Okay. And he created man. But when man sinned, what happened? It was taken out of the garden and there was a chasm, separation. What was lost in this story? What was lost? For God, He lost, he lost man. Or His son. Adam was like His son. For man, He lost Man, also known as dwelling place. Where he can live with God. So history of redemption is recovery of the son and recovery of the man. You understand? And so every time God meets a son or a, a, a person that has, because in Luke chapter 8 verse 11, he says the seed is the word of God. And so the, when God meets a person who has the word, who has the seed, his spirit, he tells him to build a house of God. He tells him to build the ark. He says, I will be there. He tells Moses to build a tabernacle. He says, I will meet you there. He says to uh, David, build a house for me. I will be there. Not only will I be there for you, I will be there for the entire nation. God is trying to provide a place where he can be, he can meet with his people. And that is called the temple. And today is called the church. So I ask you the question, why are you here tonight? I pray that it is for the reason of, of meeting with God tonight. This is the place. This is the land, the dwelling place of God. And so God makes this promise with Abraham. And now we understand why this promise is so important. We read from Genesis 15, verse 13 through 16 earlier. We're going to go back a little bit and read from verse 5. Genesis 15, 5 and 6. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. This word descendant in Hebrew is Zerah. In Genesis 3, 15, we just studied about, uh, I just talked about, that God would give a descendant offspring or seed of the woman, that word is also Zerah. Okay. So God is saying, I shall, so shall your seed be. Your descendants will be. So God is making a promise about Abraham's descendants. This is when Abraham did not have Isaac yet. He had no seed, no offspring. But God says, I will make your seed. Remember, Sarah was barren. She was not able to have a child. She was too old. But God said, your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And then God says, verses 7 and 8, Says, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord God, how may, how may I know that I will possess it? Which one which, which is easier for you to believe? When you don't have a child and you're getting close to 100 years of age, right? And God says, your children will be as many as the stars in the sky. Can you believe that? Easy to believe or not easy to believe? Please tell me to, uh, please show me that you're still alive and awake. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. So, this is not easy to believe. But God says, that land of Canaan, I'll give it to you. 
Which is easier to believe? For me, giving me that land is easier to believe. That's physically actually possible. Right? Although it's not so easy, but still easier to believe than to tell a barren person that your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. But Abraham believes this one, but this one about the land he says, how can I know? I don't think it is purely of disbelief or doubt, but even this is showing us God's plan, redemptive plan. Why? Because, let me put it in this perspective. Is it easier to believe that something God will do something on this earth for us versus the kingdom of heaven will be yours? This is uh, something that will be fulfilled on this earth. For us, this is the end, the end in Revelation. So God's reply was this. God's reply was what we read earlier. He says, then God said to Abraham, know for certain. This is God's reply to Abraham's question. How will I know that I will possess that land? God says, okay, you will know then you will possess that land when you see these things happen. Understand? What, what are these things? We will talk about it later. But God says, okay, you and I will have to meet. Your people and my, I will have to meet with your descendants. So this is called forgotten encounter. Did you know, or do you remember, they were supposed to be with God. When you were born, do you when you were born and you started to be conscious of yourself, you started to learn to learn how to reason, did you automatically remember, oh wow, I'm born in this world, what am I doing? I need to be with God. Anybody? Voluntarily, somehow automatically, oh I need to be with God. No. We we are all born with spiritual amnesia where we don't even realize that we, we are in the wrong place. That we need God. And somehow by God's grace we came to believe in Jesus. But before that, we didn't even know that we, where we need to be. We didn't even, we don't even, maybe even now, we don't even recognize the fact that we are lost. We don't even, people who are born in Egypt, they probably thought, I'm an Egyptian. I've, I've seen, I'm, I'm Korean, by the way, just in case you didn't know. I grew up in the, in the United States. And I had uh, seen many of my friends who were born in the United States. Mom is Korean, dad is Korean. So he looks like Korean. But he, grew, he grows up in the United States and goes to American school, has American friends, and he says, I am not Korean. I'm American. He denies the fact that he is Korean. I have, I have many friends. I, I used to have many friends like that. And they don't like the Korean culture because they don't like their mom and dad. They want to be separated from their, their roots. Don't you think the people who were born in Egypt, they were kind of like that? They got so used to the culture of their Same thing with us. We are supposed to be children of God. But we say we belong here. We are born here on this, on this earth, in this world. I like this world's culture, what I can do freely in this world. Why do I need to believe in God? Why do I need to recognize the fact that I am a, a child of God? Or belong to heaven? Or the fact that I need to eventually go into the kingdom of heaven? Why? We don't realize that. We are living with big amnesia. Forgotten. 
forgot to encounter with God. Of course, it was not direct our the direct experience, but the Garden of Eden was there. Our forefather, our first father, Adam, was there. But because he because of sin he got kicked out, he rejected God, and from there on we forgot about our origin. And so God says, we have to meet again. The encounter with God was lost through sin. This represents the spiritual state of fallen mankind, depicted through their life in the wilderness. So God promises to meet again. So have you ever been set apart from your loved ones? for an um, extended period of time, remember? Yes? No? Yes? Korea is a divided country. North Korea, South Korea. And my, I have a uh, grandfather who passed away. Uh, he was born before the Korean War. And, during the, and he was born in North Korea. And during the Korean War, he was separated from his family. And after the war, there is a divider. And you cannot cross over. South Koreans cannot cross over to North Korea. And North Koreans cannot cross over to South Korea. His, all his family members remain in North Korea. He's the only one in South Korea. For the rest of his life, ever since the war, he lived in tears because he wanted to see his mother. He wanted to see his sister. And that separation gave him so much pain. But there was a time when he, had, he found out that his, his uh, sister was alive in North Korea. He wanted to meet her, meet her so much. And then there was a time when uh, the two governments decided to let these uh, set families that were separated to meet again just one day. How much would you, if you were in that situation, how much would you want to meet, uh, long, would you long for that day? Have you ever been separated from your own children and you cannot see them and you miss them so much, it, it tears up your heart. But if there's just one day you can meet the person, wouldn't you give up everything just to see that person on that day? That's the kind of day this was. God says, so I have come down to deliver them. God says, I miss you guys so much. So I came down from heaven to deliver the Israelites. And he says, Verse 12, Exodus 3, 12, he said, Certainly I will be with you, and I shall be, it, it, this shall be a sign to you that it is I who sent you. God is speaking to Moses as he was sending him to Egypt to bring the people out. You understand, right? And then God says, It is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Meaning that God is saying, I will meet with you, I will wait for you here. Bring the people out and I will meet with you. This is like the first encounter between God's people and God after, ever since the fall. Of course, through individuals, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God continued to communicate with them and, and uh, reach out to them. But with the whole entire people, God is saying, and now is the time to meet. Aren't we waiting for the time when we can meet the Lord? So in order to meet with God, God says, you need to come out of Egypt. For us, in order to meet with God, we need to come out of Egypt. And where is Egypt? Revelation chapter 11 verse 8 tells us, Egypt is a place that killed, crucified Jesus. Egypt represents the place of sin, place of disobedience, place where we were, 
when we, before we came to Jesus. And those who come out of Egypt, who came out of Egypt in the wilderness, are called, it says, Acts chapter 7 verse 38, this is the one who was the, in the congregation in the wilderness. Okay? This congregation, in a definite translation, means church. In Greek, it's ecclesia. 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 Ek means out from. Ecclesia comes from the Greek word kaleo. Kaleo means to call. So, Ecclesia are the people who are called out from. Can you not see? Can you see? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I won't write too much. So, Ecclesia means people who are called out. So, God's saying, you need to become church. You need to be the ones who are called out of Egypt in order to be lifted. Secondly, you need, you need the land. In order to come out of Egypt, you need the land. And last week was Passion Week, and this past Lord's Day was Easter Sunday, Easter Lord's Day, when we remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Passion Week is a time when Jesus went through the suffering. Right? <coughs> Here it says, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. And they are to slay, slay that lamb, slay that lamb, and take the blood and put it on the doorpost. And because that lamb died for the family, those who have the blood of the lamb, when the angel of death comes by, death already takes place on behalf of them. So they don't have to kill the people in there. And so the Israelites in Egypt who had the blood of the lamb lived and survived. But the Egyptians, who did not have the blood, their firstborns died. This land later foreshadows Jesus Christ. But interestingly, not only is it a symbol, but it's a foreshadowing, it's a prophecy. Jesus came into Jerusalem on Sunday, Palm Sunday. And he was arrested on Thursday night, and he died on Friday. Right? Remember? It says, take the lamb on the tenth day, for four days you're, you're supposed to look through and make sure it's blameless. Jesus was interrogated. Jesus was with all kinds of lawyers and Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the priests came and asked him questions. And they were searching to find a reason to kill Jesus. Did they find any reason to kill Jesus? No. Ironic thing is, Jesus died because he had no name. Just like this man. For four days, they searched and questioned him. But because he was blameless, on the 14th day, at twilight, twilight is from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Jesus, on the 15th, on, on Friday, Jesus was hung on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. when he died. That was twilight. This entire process is foreshadowing <coughs> and telling us, in order for you to come out of Egypt, to go to the land of Canaan, the promised land, you need the land. 
In order for you to come and meet with me and live with me again, you need the man. And so, once again, this man, in order to come out of Egypt, in order to meet with God, God says, at this mountain, Mount Sinai, I will meet with you. And from there, I'll go with you into the promised land. But in order to come out, you need the land. You need Jesus Christ. And then, in order to meet with God, you need to walk through the wilderness, wilderness journey. As we read earlier, according to Acts chapter 7, verse 38, this is one who was in the church, right? Ecclesia, church in the wilderness together with the angels. Angel was speaking to him on Mount Sinai. Now, the wilderness is the church. No wonder church is no fun. <laughs> well, church is the wilderness. Who would, who likes to walk through the wilderness? Nobody. Church is not a fun place. It's not supposed to be. Nowadays, people try to make church fun and entertaining. But church, wilderness, is what leads us to meet with God and then to the promised land. God never said it's going to be easy. So this wilderness journey is about our life of faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. This is Apostle Paul speaking, but I would like to say the same thing. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What is this talking about? Apostle Paul is talking about the wilderness journey. Right? Under the cloud, God provided the pillars of cloud for them. They were under the cloud. They went through the sea, under the, uh, through the sea. Remember? Which sea? What's the name of the sea? Red sea? The Red Sea. The Red Sea, God parted and opened up so that they went through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So he is comparing our life of faith with the wilderness journey. So through the wilderness journey, as they were going through the Red Sea, it is foreshadowing our life of faith, where we receive Jesus Christ, we are saved from Egypt, and when we start to come into church, what do we get? What do we get? We get baptized. In verse 3, and all ate the same spiritual food. You start to come to church, you get baptized, you commit your life to Jesus, and then, what do you receive? You receive Bible studies. <laughs> <laughs> you receive the Word. And that's the heavenly manna, spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. He quenches our thirst. When Jesus came to this earth, He said, I am the heavenly manna that came down out of heaven. He said, I am the, the water that I provide you. You will drink it, you will never thirst again. He said, you receive my word, you will have eternal life. And those who thirst, come to me, for I give you the water. So, Let's go back to this map again. Reverend Sharon Park, the author of this book, really presented this map, not as a map of Israel, but a map of your life. This even shows us what Jesus will do on this earth. This even shows us the end time. Where is the end time? The promised land is the place where we want to go to. Spiritually, the kingdom of heaven. And our entire life, the history of salvation until we go to heaven is written on this map. We don't have time to go through all that. Maybe next next trip. But
he put it into five different courses. Okay? You can see the color theme here. One, two, three, four, five. Five different courses in the wilderness. And let us uh, briefly think about those five courses. Okay? From, from Egypt, they depart from Ramses. First uh, site where they camped was Sukkot, Islam, before we go, and so on. And so up to Mount Sinai, wilderness of Sinai, is first course. Okay? And that is where most of the miracles took place. This shows us the first stage of our life. How many stages of, uh, do, uh, are there in a person's life? From birth to weaning or kindergarten? And then from your school age, uh, primary school, and then secondary school, and then high school or, or university. And then there's a new stage of life. You graduate from school, you go into the society work place. And then there's another stage of your life where you get married and have a family. If you are going to get married. And then there's another stage where you have children and you are raising children. And then there's another stage where you are retired. There's different stages of life. Likewise, there, there are different stages of our life of faith. When we first come to believe in Jesus, we cannot really believe unless we see things and we experience things. And so God provides and shows us a lot of miracles. Parting the sea, manna coming down from heaven, rock providing water, all kinds of things, amazing things. In this first stage. And even a lot of the com complaints and grumblings take place here. You first believe in Jesus, you're still doubting. And so you can start complaining. One little thing happens, you complain. If you're still complaining and grumbling day by day, you're only at the first stage of your life in faith. Still babies. The next stage is, begins from here. This is where God gave the, the law, the word. He formed it into military array. He counted the, the soldiers, military, people who can fight in the war. So God is forming a nation of people who are more mature. He teaches the word. He teaches them what you need to do and what you need to be like in order to be called people of God. He's getting them ready to live in the land that God is restoring to live together with them. Are we there yet? Spiritually, are you there? In this place, they learn what is good, what is not good, the Ten Commandments and the Law. Now that they know the Word, now that they're more spiritually mature, God re requests of them obedience. God says, okay, now that we learn, come up and go and he, they came here, and they, God says, go into Canaan. Go into Canaan. And from this time on, when they complain, God judges. God sends a fire. God opens up the, the ground and swallows them. And people die. Because they don't believe. Oh, in the first stage, no such thing. No punishment. God takes their complaints. But after they know the word, they're more mature, and God starts to request of them their belief, their willingness to follow Jesus, and follow His word, and obedience. But they don't obey. So, what happens? Next stage, as a result of disobedience, they learn a lesson. For 38 years, they go around. Do you, do you see this 
this mumbo jumbo, you know, all tangled up here. They start from here. God says, do go in. Remember the ten spies versus the two spies? They end up disobeying. Whose thoughts are come out first? Instead of following the word of God, they give their own human reasons why they cannot go into the land of Canaan. You understand? And as a result of rejecting God's word and putting their own thoughts before God's word, God says, okay, then. You stay in the wilderness. If you want to go to heaven fast without seeing death, key point is obedience, putting God's word before our own thoughts. Who are those people, two people who entered into the land of Canaan, the promised land, without seeing death? God, Caleb and Joshua. Joshua and Caleb. Right? They did not die in the wilderness. But the rest of the people who are here to disobey, they perished in the wilderness. But they didn't die right away. They went through 38 years. Round, 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 round. round. And they began here at, from Rithma. 38 years later, where were they? Right here, Kadesh. Right back to the same place. Waste of time. And then they went down here, and here, yeah, Barry, they all died. After all that suffering, all that time, they died. So this is, these are the courses of, of our life of faith. And God is prophesying and, and telling Abraham, this is what's going to happen. So what is the content of the covenant of the torch? Why, the, why is it called the covenant of the torch? Genesis chapter 5, verses 9 to 12. God said, remember Abraham asked God a question, how will I know that you will give us, give me that land? God said, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and, young, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came upon the carcasses and Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And after that, God says, Know for certain that your descendants will be oppressed in the land. What we read, verses 13 through 16. What is God doing? He says, Okay, you want to know how I'm going to give you this land? Give me this sacrifice. But it's not just a sacrifice. He says, bring all these animals, cut them in two. Okay? And put one on this side and one on that side. Half and half. Okay? So you put one half here, you know, the, the heifer, the, what was it? The goats and uh, the, the animals on this one half and the other half. You have a family in between. Okay? For us, we, we don't know what he's doing, but in the uh, ancient Near East, they all knew what is going on. This is a treaty uh, exercise of signing a treaty. When you uh, make, a, make a contract, when you're buying a house or business deal, what do you do? You have to, make, you have to sign many papers. Right? How many, how many copies do you make? Two copies. One for him, one for me. One copy and the other copy. Understand? And then, it's supposed to be blood signature, but we don't do that, we use ink. Right? But when you write your name, sign it, you're saying, I am responsible for this, what I sign. I put my name on it. Right? Now, in those, during those days, they cut those pieces into, and this party, party, 
has to go through and in between. And then that party has to go through in between. Meaning, if I don't keep this promise, this treaty, I will become like that. You understand? And you don't, you walk through your promising, if you don't keep this treaty, you become like that. Give, give my life for this promise. Okay? This is what, this is, this was a general practice, also written in Jeremiah. And God told Abraham to cut the pieces, and Abraham did that. This is very important. You have to, you have to look here. Okay. Verse 17. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these two pieces. Who, who went through it? The torch, God. What does the flaming torch represent? The flaming torch represents God's presence. We don't have time, but you can refer to these passages. All these passages tell us the presence of God is represented by a flaming torch. Flame of fire. Oops. Are you, are you done? So, covenant of the torch is God's promise to restore the promised land. This entire content is, okay, this is how I'm going to give you the land. Your descendants will be taken to a foreign land. They will be oppressed for 400 years. And then, I will bring them back. Okay? That's the promise. Then, when I bring them back, this land will be yours. That was God's answer. But, who, who walked through? God, represented by the flaming torch, walked through. According to the practice of making the contract during that time, who else needs to walk through? Two people. God had went through. Who needs to go through now? Abraham needs to walk. But the Bible says, only the flaming torch walked through. This is God's covenant. Unilateral covenant. One-sided. God says, you don't have to walk through because you don't have to be responsible for this. I will be responsible. I will be the sole party, the only party that will be responsible to make sure that this redemption takes place. That is the love of God. This Exodus is a foreshadowing of our salvation through Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus that we are taken out of our spiritual Egypt. Right? And God says, you don't have to do anything. I will do it. And that's why this is called the covenant of the flaming torch. And Psalm 105, verses 7 through 10, He's the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He has remembered His covenant forever. The word which He commanded to a thousand generations. The covenant which He made with Abraham and His oath to Isaac that He confirmed, to, confirmed it to Jacob for a statue to Israel as an everlasting covenant. So, what is the process? We, we read this earlier. He said, first, your descendants will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. Second, they will come out with many possessions. Third, you will be buried at a good old age, speaking to Abraham, right? And then, fourth, in the fourth generation, they will return. So, oppression for 400 years. How long were the Israelites in Egypt? Anybody know? Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 tells us, and also Exodus chapter 1. Uh, so they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Python and Amphis. Uh Sorry. According to Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, they were in, the, in Egypt for 430 years. 430 years. But why does God say 400 years? Some people say, see, Bible is wrong. 
They were in Egypt for 430 years, but God said 400 years. His prophecy did not come true. Anybody <laughs> would like to argue against that? The Bible doesn't match up. They were literally there for 430 years. Exodus chapter 12 verse 40. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. So was God wrong? Did he calculate wrongly? And so what if non-believers or people who don't like the Bible come to you and say, Hey, see, the Bible was wrong. God prophesied 400 years, but they were here 430 years. What's wrong? There are many places like that that tell us, uh, that seem like the Bible is wrong. But remember, even non-Christians who are smart enough can defend this. So are you smart enough? No. <laughs> we need spiritual show of this here. That's how exciting the Bible is. I don't know if it's exciting for you yet, but... He said they will be oppressed for 400 years, right? What does that mean? When they first went in, what was the condition? Joseph was the Prime. second in, in charge. So they were not oppressed. Later, the, the regime changed, the government changed, and the, there came a king that did not know about Joseph. And then they started to oppress, like here. So they appointed taskmasters to afflict the Israelites. And so for the first 30 years, they lived in peace. They actually were honored by the Pharaoh because this is Joseph's family. But later, for 400 years, they are oppressed. Second, God, God said, your descendants, however, will come out with many possessions. What happened? Exodus 12, 35 to 38, we'll only read verse 36. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have their request. They, as, thus they plundered the Egyptians. When they were coming out during the Exodus, they asked the Egyptian owners, Can we have your, uh, I saw a diamond in your treasure box. Can I have, a, can I have your gold, this, gold, that? And the Egyptians were so scared because of the ten plagues. They gave it up. They were just take it, take it, just go, go. Right? This is a fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham. <coughs> Sir, you will go to your fathers in peace and a good old, good old age. This is about Abraham. And Genesis chapter 25 verse 8 tells us that exactly what God said. Abraham breathed his last and died at a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life, meaning he fulfilled God's will and was gathered to his people. And fourth, they will return in the fourth generation. And this is what our missionary Lee will share with us. This is the most important item in the promise. And most why? Who's the fourth generation? Why the fourth generation? And why God did God say this? You will return to this land in the fourth generation. Meaning, I will... We remember the question? Abraham said, how will I know that you will give me this land? He says, the fourth generation will know. The fourth generation is the key, is a clue. If you know the fourth generation, you will know that this land is yours. So, I won't cover that. It's, it's her study. As a conclusion, why Canaan? Remember in the, in the map? Supposed to go, the, the final destination is Canaan. The name Canaan for the Jews, the Israelites, is pleasant or not pleasant? 
It's kind of like telling the Koreans, I will give you a, a, a land inheritance in North Korea. You have, to, you have to move to North Korea if you want to see the fulfillment of my promise. If he says in the US or in, even in Melbourne or in, in Singapore, I say Amen. If God says, I'll give you a, a plot of land as your inheritance, it's in North Korea. Canaan is a, is a cursed name. Right? Remember Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's three sons? Who's the first one? Ham was cursed. And as a result, Canaan was cursed. And the people who were living in Canaan were cursed people that Abraham, who is a descendant of Shem, would not even see anymore. Greatest enemies. But God said, Canaan is blessed. The land of Canaan is a blessed land. Why Canaan? Canaan, the land represents this is a promised land of God, but occupied with a cursed people. Land in the Bible represents our heart. This land is supposed to be occupied with God, just like the garden of Eden. This land, our hearts, are supposed to be owned by God, by Jesus Christ. But who occupies this land? The Canaanites. The cursed people who worship idols. People who, whom we hate. Sometimes, sometimes, God teaches us through our enemies. Do you have a, do you have a person that you don't really like to see in the church? <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to tell me. Because I, I know that you do. Every church, every every Christian has somebody that you, they want they want to see in the church. If you don't have a person that you don't like in the church, you are a true saint. You don't belong here, you belong in heaven. But in your heart, name that person that you don't like. Gift of God. Angel. Call that, call that person your angel. Because, trust me, until you go to heaven, you will be with that person. <laughs> this is not my curse to you, this is my blessing to you. Do you know why you hate that person so much? It's because that person is exactly like you. <laughs> the, the, the darkness, the ugly, self-image that you're trying to hide is coming out of that person. That person is your mirror. It's your soulmate. Canaan is occupying the holy land, blessed land of God. What's occupying my heart? Why Canaan? Why Canaan? In order for us to enter into that land, we need to take out the seven tribes of Canaan. Matthew chapter 15 verse 19 tells us about the seven tribes of Canaan. Matthew chapter 15 verse 19 it says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. And so, why Canaan? We'll read one more verse and we'll finish today. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 8 through 23. You shall therefore keep every commandment which I am commanding you today, so that you may be strong and go in and possess the land into which you are about to cross to possess it. 
so that you may prolong your days on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. So God, God is speaking to the Israelites right before they went into the land of Canaan. He says, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. I think Australia might be the closest image of Canaan on this earth today. Amen. Because Australia has very good milk and very good honey. <laughs> but Egyptians, uh, the Israelites in Egypt, some of them were probably thinking like I did. I can say, Singapore still has good milk and honey. I can just, uh, it's, it's only a little bit more expensive, but I can still get it in Singapore. I don't have to come all the way to Australia to get good milk and good honey. I can find it in Singapore, where I live. Same thing the Israelites were saying. Egypt has good milk, it has milk and honey. Why do we have to go all the way to the wilderness? Why do we have to spend all that time and energy to go there? What's the difference? You might say, you might say, my life is comfortable and you know I, st I have enough money and I have a pretty good satisfied life. Why do I have to be with Jesus? You know? Spend all that time going to church, have to keep offering, all the requirements, restrictions, right? Why? Because my life still provides. Right? And still live my life. Egypt still has milk and honey. Why do we have to go to Canaan? And over there, it's occupied with Canaanites, scary people. It's a lot of work. Why? Enjoy your life. Enjoy your life here. Why go there? Don't you agree with me? You do? Then why are you here today? Why are you spending that at this extra time, this night time, and if you don't have a car, you have to, you know, pay a lot of money for taxi. Australian taxi or, or Grab or Uber, very expensive, right? Why? Spend the extra money, time, and energy so you can listen to this, I don't know who, from, I don't know where, you know, Singapore, is it Singaporean or, or Korean or American, I don't know. But why do you have to sit here and listen to this guy? Why the, why the waste of time and energy? God says, this is why. For the land into which you are entering to possess it is like the land of Egypt, which you came. What? Well, it's not like the land of Egypt, which you came. Where you used to sow your seed and water it with your foot like a vegetable garden. But in the land into which you are about to cross to possess it, a land of hills and valleys drinks water from the rain of heaven. What's the difference? He says, the land of Egypt where you came from, the source of life is from the waters below. The waters below called the river Nile. And when you sow, you have to foot. It says, sow your seed and water it with your foot. Irrigation. You know, treadmill or that, that water mill. They have to foot it to provide water to the field so that it can have crops. That's why Nile River was a, Nile, a river of idols, river of gods, because it provided life. What provides your life? What provides your army? And they said, they said, when things are not good, they went to the Nile River and prayed. Because now River is what provided Mulan money in living, living. So whatever that comes out from now River was their idol. Flies, frogs, you know, water, everything that gnats, everything that came out of now River was their God. Who's the land? What where is your now river? Is it this world? Yes, this world that provides everything for us. And if somebody said, Wow, oh, you have big crops, they would say, Yes, I worked hard. 
I put in the, the water to provide, uh, to provide for this field. I worked hard. From the Nile River, water came, and I'm successful. So it's the idol and me that provides for my life. Eventually, I become the source of, I become the one of the idols. And who owns the Nile River? Pharaoh owned the Nile River. So Pharaoh is the big god who is controlling the Nile River. So they worship the Pharaoh, they worship the Nile River, they worship everything in it. That's why through the ten plagues, all the things that came up in the ten plagues are were the Egyptian gods. And God is saying, I am more powerful than the nets. I am more powerful than the flies. I am more powerful than all these things. But the land into which you are going to possess, the kind of life that we are going to live now, he's saying you used to live in Egypt, now you have to live in Canaan. The difference is the water, source of life, comes from heaven. There's no Nile River out there. So what do you have to do in order to receive the source of life, water? The only thing you can do is to pray to God. Depend on God. You don't have to put your water. It doesn't, it's not your works that gives you salvation. It's only from God. That's why Jesus comes and says, those who need water, come to me. A land for which the Lord your God cares, right? The land that the Lord God cares. When we live in our spiritual Canaan, God cares for your life. His eyes, the eyes of the Lord your God are always on it. From the beginning even to the end of the year. It shall come about if you listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your hearts and all your soul, that He will give the rain for your land and in its season, an early and late rain, and you may gather in your grain and uh, your new wine and your and your and your oil. He will give grass in your fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. So. The land of Canaan is a place where you don't have to depend on the idols. It's a land without the idols. One of the things that really upset God is worshiping of the idols. And so as conclusion, let us think about our your your issues where you are, where you used to worship idols, or follow idols. Even after coming out of Egypt, they, they had this habit of depending on their idols again and again. All the way to the very end of the wilderness journey, they kept on going back to their idols. Why is it so easy for us to worship idols? What's an idol for you? Idol is something that you depend more than God. Where idol is something that you spend more time than you spend with God. What is your idol? Is your idol money? Is your idol, I don't know, what provides for you? What are you more dependent on? Canaan is a place where you can give up your idols. So, because of the lack of time, I'm not going to get uh, too much into this idol thing. But let us think about this today. God wants us to come and live with Him and go into the land of Canaan. Where are you in your life? Are you still in Egypt, satisfied about what Egypt provides? One thing different about Canaan is that is where God cares for you. That is where God wants you to. That is where we can find ourselves back, where we can live with God and be blessed with God. 
I pray that everyone here and every member of this church will be able to take on their journey toward the land of Canaan, the promised land. Let us pray.